You ever thought that there are people that have gone to hell today that never thought they would go there? I mean, they might have thought they would go there, but they never really believed that they would go to hell. They never actually knew what hell was going to be like. They never actually believed that they would someday go there. They probably thought they were good, you know. I mean, after all, they're Christians, of course. They never thought that they were going to go there, but they're there. Right now, many of them cursing God because some preacher told them that God was loved and that love was tolerance and that God would never make them feel condemned. Ever heard the phrase, a little sugar makes the medicine go down, more like a little truth makes deception acceptable? I want to be very clear on something. I have a heart for every soul, lost and saved. But this video, from the very first idea of it until the very last edit that I made, was made for church people. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to church people, the people that already think they believe in Christ, the people that serve in churches, the people that evangelize the lost people of the church. You know, I'm going to tell you something. It's an absolute no second question, no explanation, no hearing of your life story, impossibility for you to be saved and yet live in a continuous state of worldliness. And you say things like, God will forgive me. God has been with me since I was a kid. After all, I got saved a long time ago. Surely he will just forget about all this. You say things like that, but you keep on doing all the evil that you can. You intentionally indulge in your favorite sin and while there's still time to stop. While there's still time for you to just think about it and say, now I don't want to do it in the same breath. You say, boy, I sure am glad God is merciful. But Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, looks down from heaven and he says, do you have any idea what your forgiveness cost? My flesh torn off my neck and back and laying in a crown of thorns jammed into my head, uh, stabbed in the side or gushed from my hands and from my feet and from my back, just to cover the thing that you are so lightly indulging in. But in use these things that I went through in the physical, they were nothing compared to what I was going through in the spiritual. If you multiplied all of these physical things that I had gone through times a thousand, it still cannot cover your one sin. But God, the Father, beat me into pieces. He obliterated me. Beyond recognition, he took the cup of wrath that had your name on it, and he splashed it into my perfectly sinless and bleeding face. And what's worse is God did this with a smile. It pleased him to crush me for you. And that's what your forgiveness cost me. Most professing Christians have never realized their actual need for Christ. They've been invited to come to him in such a way that it seems like, well, I'm doing God a favor just to believe in Christ. They've never been told that the very first level of Christianity is a complete denial of all your desires and of everything that you've ever been. They've not been clearly shown that whosoever does not wake up in the morning and die to every one of his desires is not even worthy of walking in Jesus' footsteps. They don't understand that being a Christian means that they are crucified to the world and that the world is crucified to them. That means that the world thinks of you as a fool, that has nothing to contribute to society, and that there's nothing that the world offers that you could desire, and that you now have nothing to do with sin and everything to do with God. It has been told to the very many professing Christians that Jesus said and meant, no one can serve two masters. You will hate one and you will love the other every time. If you do not mind it very much when people use his glorious name in vain, if you do not mind being seen in the places that were built to be places of sin, if you do not feel deeply offended at the fornications in your favorite movies, at the scoffing of the glorious name of Jesus, and the jokes that defy his very throne and slap his face in rebellion, then you hate him. And it's not really hard to figure out because Jesus said, you will hate one and love the other always. If you love the world, then you hate him or else Jesus was wrong. But you say, no, that ain't true. I love Jesus. Jesus is Lord. But who are you trying to convince? Isn't it interesting that when anyone brings a word of correction about your sin, you immediately pass them off as unchristlike and judgmental? It's disgusting that it's more of a scandal in this church culture to reprove sin than it is to laugh at it. The one who says sin is wrong is judgmental, and the one who commits it encourages others to do it as Christ-like. How disgusting. You don't want to be like God. You just want people to back off when they start reproving the thing that you were the most in love with. Uh, true love for God means true hatred of sin. In Matthew 7 and in Luke 17, Jesus says that many will be telling him on that day that he is the actual Lord of their life. But he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Your professed faith in Jesus means absolutely nothing. And you say, well, you know, you can't really judge a book by its cover. 
Well, that whole idea is really an invent of Satan because Jesus said you can judge a book by its cover. In John 15, he said, you will know false prophets by their fruit. Tell me, how long would it actually take for you if you walked up to an apple tree and there were fruits of apples all over it and for you to say, hey, that's an apple tree. Uh, a good tree cannot bear fruit and the bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Uh, that's what Jesus said. And Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire. Uh, no one has to hear what you've been through. No one has to know at what point you got saved. All they have to do is look at your fruit. Uh, you've been serving in church your whole life, but look at your fruit for a second. What are the things that come out of your mouth when you talk to people in conversation? Uh, what are your affections set towards? Are they God things? You can tell him that you've served in church. You can tell him that he is Lord. But if you die without bearing Christ's fruits, you will go to hell for all of eternity and 10 million years will pass and you'll be under the weight of this thing that no human on earth can bear uh, for even a second. And it'll be like no time has passed in eternity. No time. A hundred million years passes and it's the same. You're there. Uh, there you are suffering the wrath of God because you believe some lying creature that was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, they just tried to encourage you and so you may be saying hey you're judgmental you're unchristlike uh, you are condescending you're heavy uh, you're turning people off by the way that you talk can't you see that i want you to live that's the main purpose of your existence to live that's god's number one desire the biggest problem in the bible if you read it is that god is faced with this uh, that if he is just he cannot forgive you uh, go talk to the lost people on the streets and see if they don't tell you that God is forgiving. Uh, they've heard of the tremendous love of God, and yet they're still in love with the very sin that crushed and murdered him. And so are many of you. Hey, let's watch a movie tonight. What, there's nudity and there's 12 GDs and 140 F-words? Um, that's all right. I have freedom in Christ. Freedom from what? Uh, freedom to let some of the worst words that can spill out of your human mouth serve as your entertainment? And yet you still claim that you love him with all your whole heart. You make light-hearted gestures at the very things that murdered him. Uh, not only that she spit in the bloody face of the Lamb of God as he hangs on the jagged wood taking your wrath. Uh, you said, don't worry, he forgives. Do you know the character of the God you serve? The book of Jeremiah. God's people have been wicked by serving other gods and having their affections set on other things. And willfully sinning and not saying that they had sinned. And not acknowledging their need for God. So we find Jeremiah in chapter 14 repenting genuine biblical repentance for the people of God. And he said, Lord, we confess our wickedness and that of our ancestors too. We have all sinned against you for the sake of your reputation. Lord, do not abandon us. Do not disgrace your own glorious throne. Please remember us and do not break our covenant with us. It's really good repentance and it's really genuine and it's better than what most of you pray. But what may shock you is God's response. Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me pleading for these people, I would help them away. Get them out of my sight, he told Jeremiah. Do not go to funerals to mourn and show sympathy for these people, for I have removed my peace and my protection from them. I have taken away my unfailing love and mercy. These weren't the lost people of the world. These were his people. So you may be questioning, Stephen, why are you saying this to me? You still sound judgmental. Well, I heard the story of a young man that was dying on his deathbed, and his brother was there next to him, and he said, Brother, why have you been so indifferent to me about my soul as you have been? And his brother said, Indifferent? I have not been indifferent to you. I have spoken to you often about it. And the brother said, Yeah, you have spoken to me, but I think that if you would have remembered that I was going down to hell, you would have been more earnest with me. Every time you hear a sermon, and you see a video, or you hear a song that's convicting, or anything, you have a chance to either repent or harden your heart. Some of you have watched a video I've made in the past and you thought, wow, that's really good. Or maybe you've told me, hey, I'm going to start changing. Thank you for this. But you really haven't decided to go ahead and change and tap into the grace of God. You're hardening your heart against him and you're making it harder for yourself. Don't make your judgment twice as bad for hearing the word of the Lord and then ignoring it. I'm telling you about hell and I'm telling you that someday you're going to go there unless you repent. But if you harden your heart and you live your whole life and you die and go to hell without repenting, you will look back on this day. The day that you watch this video and from the flames of hell you will curse. You will curse the day that you were born, you will curse this day. And you will say, I wish I had never even watched that because now I know that he was right. But now I know that hell is real, that he wasn't just trying to scare me and that is where I was going. 
I was going to burn there for all eternity. Now I see the truth. Now I see. I've got to tell you something very solemn. There's nothing in this life that you can view that will take away glory from God. And in the end, he will be glorified in your life. There's a verse of scripture that talks about how for all eternity, the lake of fire will be open for people to come and see the fierce wrath of God. And they will be able to observe how majestic he is and they will see it with all their hearts and they will come back and worship him. Do you know what mercy is? Mercy is that you can choose and so you choose. Will God be glorified by your damnation and eternal punishment? Or will he be glorified by your salvation and your worship? And I realize a lot of you think I'm crazy, but just ask yourself, what is it going to matter if you are on your deathbed, if you get one, and when you're just a few breaths away from death? What is it going to matter? Is it going to matter whether or not you graduated from college? No. Is it going to matter whether or not I've written a song or whether I've painted a picture or done anything? Nothing is going to matter when your breaths away from eternity. Don't you think that you'll wish when that time comes that you really would love God the way you said? Or maybe you did. You'd actually flip the TV off uh, a little more to study God-breathed scriptures. I know I will, no matter how much I've done it. I know that I'll wish that I would have done it more. And the good news is Christ is calling. He's calling loud. And wisdom is calling out in the streets. And he's calling for you to come. He's holding the door of mercy wide open as far as it can go. And he's saying, come dine with me. And to dine with him, you have to die. Uh, to you, the one whose name you abused and whose cross you mocked by the way that you live is alive and he is coming. Uh, but you may die before he does. All you have is now.